On today's episode, I'm going to do something very special for you, my wonderful listeners, because it is Christmas. And to celebrate Christmas, I would love to give you a gift. I have two chapters that I have chosen from my book, Normal for Me, that I am going to give you. This is to celebrate the launch of my audiobook, which happened just a few weeks ago. And so I would love to share with you chapter three and chapter seven from my book, Normal for Me. Chapter three is one of the most heartfelt chapters in my book. It is when I talk about my son Nathan's diagnosis. And it was actually hard for me to write, but it was also hard for me to read because every time I read it, I go through those same emotions all over again. I actually had to stop several times when I was recording it because I would get a little emotional. In this chapter three, its title is Diagnosis, Dead End or Detour. And it talks about the life detours that we face. And one of the fun things I did in this chapter was I kind of wove in the story of Moses and the children of Israel as they are leaving Egypt and they get to the edge of the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army is coming after them. And they're like, oh no, we're going to die. And don't we all feel like that at some point in our life? We're like, God, I've been following the path you wanted me to take. I am at a total dead end. I don't know which way to go. I don't know why you've brought me here. And I kind of talk about how I went through all of those emotions. And then God opens up a path I'd never chosen. And it's through the Red Sea and into the wilderness where I was able to learn a lot of things on my detoured path. And so I hope you enjoy this chapter three. It is a wonderful, heartfelt chapter where you will be able to experience a lot of my journey and relate to it. I'm also sharing with you chapter seven, and chapter seven's title is called My Toolbox. And this is a really fun chapter where I tell you a little bit about one of my hobbies, which happens to be using my toolbox. I actually love fixing things. I tell you a little bit about a Christmas gift that I got when I was 12 years old and how that plays into some of the things that God expects us to do certain things and learn certain things so that he can help us know what actions we're supposed to take to get us through. So I'm not going to give you any more than that. Sit back and enjoy these gift chapters from my book, Normal for Me. And remember that Jesus is the reason for the season. Welcome to Stories of Hope in Hard Times, the show that explores how people endure and even thrive in difficult times, all with God's help. I'm your host, Tamara K. Anderson. Join me on a journey to find inspiring stories of hope and wisdom learned in life's hardest moments. Chapter 3. Diagnosis, Dead End, or Detour As a teenager, I used to dream about what my future would entail. I imagined graduating from high school, going to college, serving a mission for my church, getting married, graduating from college, and having a beautiful family that would be quite perfect. I dreamed my children earned superb grades because I did, excelled as athletes because my husband did, sang in choir, loved going to church, graduated with honors, volunteered for missions, married, and founded beautiful families of their own. Of course, life rarely unfolds as we dream or plan. Expectations. I remember attending a class one evening many years ago where a good friend of mine spoke about expectations. She explained many of the bumps in life happen from unfulfilled expectations, and we need to learn to communicate our expectations in marriage and in life. We also need to hold realistic views of expectations. Take my dream of the ideal life. In my dream life, 
Everything was roses and ticker tape parades with a cherry on top. There was nothing worse than a skinned knee that could be kissed away or a misunderstanding that could be easily fixed. There was no room for the things that come to everyone sooner or later. Sickness, loss, heartache, and like the old joke goes, taxes and death. This concept of unfulfilled expectations was an eye-opener to me. The more I thought about it, the more I realized the truth in her advice. I always seemed to have an idea in my mind about how I think a certain situation should unfold. And if it doesn't turn out how I imagined it would, I choose to be upset or frustrated. I now understand better that while it's wonderful to have expectations and strive for them, they must be balanced with a healthy dose of realism. This is different than being negative. Let me give you an example. I heard the story of a former POW from Vietnam who spoke about his experience and that of his comrades. He explained that prisoners who died the soonest tended to be the overly optimistic ones. They had unrealistic expectations of rescue, and when that didn't happen, they tended to quickly lose hope and stamina. In contrast, those who held firmly to hope of rescue or escape, but also tempered that with the realities of their situation, tended to have higher survival rates. Hopefully, we will not experience such a traumatic event, but no matter what curveballs life throws at us, learning to combine optimism with a calm acceptance that we can't dictate every detail in life can help us face the unexpected with balance. I realize I would often feel that way about things which changed my life. I figured out I needed to try to pause when life threw me an unexpected twist and think about how I was going to react because often I could not control the situation, but I could control how I reacted to it. Sometimes our unfulfilled expectations are life-changing. Having a child with autism, being diagnosed with cancer or another debilitating illness, experiencing the unexpected death of a loved one or infidelity. What do we do then? Who do we talk to about that? How do we come to grips with these life-altering events? I think I've figured out two secrets which keep me going. They are things I had to learn the hard way by walking through my own unexpected detour through the wilderness with God. Number one, God has a much better plan for my life than I do. Number two, he is the one I need to talk to when life's expectations get inexplicably altered. So, when your expectations are changed, talk to God. When life puts you on an unexpected detour, talk to God. When life shatters, talk to God. The question for me then became, Do I have faith God will guide me in the way he knows is best? Do I believe the challenges I encounter are things I can overcome with God's help? Do I believe he will help me? Those questions may be easy to answer in the good times, but in the hard times, when expectations have been shattered, well, That is when true faith is tried and either made stronger or falters. I had to live through major detours to learn a little bit more about myself, God, and expectations. Back to my story. I did graduate from high school and college, learning and growing along the way. Much to my blessing, I served a mission for my church and married a wonderful and fun young man, Justin Anderson, with whom I can say I am equally yoked. Having children hasn't been as easy as I thought it would be, and I'm sure every parent can echo those words. But the challenges I faced with an autism diagnosis turned my world upside down. Where is the promised land? There is this great story in the Old Testament which talks about Moses leading the children of Israel out of Egypt. 
I think it perfectly exemplifies the emotions of hitting a life detour. The children of Israel had lived in Egypt for over 400 years as slaves to the Egyptians. Quote, the Lord said, I have surely seen the afflictions of my people and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. God told Moses, quote, I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and bring them out of the land unto a good land, flowing with milk and honey, even a promised land. Following the plagues, Pharaoh let them leave with Moses. After they fled, Pharaoh pursued them with 600 of his finest chariots and blocked their exit on one side while they were, quote, entangled in the land and the wilderness hath shut them in with cliffs too tall to scale on their north and west and the Red Sea to their east. They were at a dead end. When the Israelites saw Pharaoh's army in pursuit, they panicked. They were literally stuck with nowhere to go. They were sore afraid and cried out unto the Lord. They also complained fiercely to Moses, quote, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Basically, they were complaining. Did you bring us here to die? Quote, we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians, for it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. This, my friends, is a life detour. The children of Israel were unhappy with their lives as slaves to the Egyptian, but it seemed easier than what they were facing a dead end with certain death. There are times in life when we may feel this way, like we've been backed into a corner. Things have gone from bad to worse, and now we don't see any way out. We are stuck. We may even be wondering, where is the promised land? I came for the happy ending, not the dead end. Basically, we want to skip from act one of life to Act 3, without the growth that happens in Act 2, because muddling through the wilderness of Act 2 is awful and hard. What do we do when this happens? Do we weep and wail like the children of Israel? Do we cry and complain to God and those around us we feel have caused our predicament? If you had asked me years ago how I would react if I was faced with a similar situation, I'm sure I would have said that I would have had faith and would have trusted God and Moses. It is easy to think you will be brave. But my courage completely failed me when Nathan received his diagnosis. I wish I could say differently. I will never forget the drive home from Little Rock, Arkansas, where Nathan, then four years old, received the diagnosis of autism. I sobbed and wept uncontrollably. I don't think my husband had ever seen me cry so much. Finally, he pulled the car to the side of the road and tried to help calm me down. I wept because my beautiful and fragile dreams for my sweet Nathan were smashed into such tiny shards they could never be put back together. I physically felt as if my heart like my dreams had shattered beyond repair. I cannot adequately describe the anguish and the crippling pain I felt. It was devastatingly real. I didn't want the diagnosis to be autism because there's no cure. Some of the pain was for Nathan. He would never experience life as I had. School would be different. He would probably never play sports. He probably would never go to college, serve a mission, get married, or have children of his own. Some of the pain I felt was for me. Being the parent of a child with a disability was not in my plan. It was not what I had dreamed my life would entail. I didn't want that burden. I didn't want that life. I wanted a normal life. I wanted normal kids. I wanted my dream life. 
Basically, I wanted to go back to Egypt. I was just as bad as the Israelites. I was backed into a corner, and I was sore afraid. With hope shattered, I couldn't see a way out, and grief assailed me. I was looking for my promised land before I went through the wilderness. I also cried out unto the Lord. I had experienced too many little miracles in my life to deny He was there. I knew God lived and was aware of my grief and pain. I knew He could fix it. I just didn't know how. I think many fathers have a really hard time with these life detours for this exact reason. We have built up our own expectations of being an amazing dad. For me, that meant taking my child fishing, coaching their sports team, or giving them dating advice from a man's perspective. Dads want to have sons they can wrestle, tickle, roughhouse, and be crazy with. I wanted to teach Nathan to throw a ball, jump something scary, or other normal things. Like Tamara, my expectations were completely shattered when Nathan was diagnosed. I didn't cry like she did, probably because we needed one parent to keep it together. But I felt hollow inside. The role I was supposed to play for this child was completely ripped away from me. I was feeling such selfish thoughts inside, even while I was providing comfort and encouragement to Tamara. My prayers to God were more for her at first. I was really worried if she could get through this grief quickly enough to help move things forward for Nathan. This is a very helpless feeling and something no parent wants to feel. But for dads, this can be just as hard because we often lock things up inside. Could I help Tamara get past this grief? Would I be able to resolve my own? Prayer was going to be a key way to get to these answers quickly. The Grieving Process I wish someone had told me I would go through the grieving process for a little boy I could never raise normally. I wish someone had explained the importance of being gentle with myself. As a believer, I couldn't understand why I was so angry with God or why I felt so depressed when my prayers weren't answered the way I desired. I wish I wouldn't have felt guilt on top of grief for the emotions raging within. Realizing I would experience the grief cycle would have helped me recognize the emotions I was feeling as normal. There should be a psychologist or grief counselor on hand for anyone who faces a life-changing diagnosis. Maybe not everyone needs it, but I did. Though at first, I wasn't in any emotional state to talk with a counselor. But after the initial shock, grief counseling would have helped. Be gentle with yourself. Grieving is a natural step considering the loss of normal dreams and expectations. I didn't know it then, but looking back, I can see my husband and I went through many of the stages of grief as we dealt with Nathan's autism. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Denial. Oh, yes. On the three-and-a-half-hour drive home from the hospital, my husband and I decided we wouldn't tell anyone about the diagnosis. How is that for denial? (laughs) We couldn't even talk about Nathan's diagnosis of autism for a few months. It was too hard. We had to let our hearts heal a little and allow our brains time to wrap themselves around the fact our life would be different than we had planned or expected. I remember telling the diagnosing physician that one of Nathan's therapists said Nathan couldn't be autistic because he let you touch him. This is a trait of some autistic children, but not all. The diagnosing physician said before we left she would be glad to say she was wrong if we could prove it. I left her office with this one sliver of a thought in my head. We 
would prove her wrong. He was not autistic. Denial? You bet. We told Nathan's preschool teachers the hospital would send us the report with the diagnosis in several weeks, which was true. Meanwhile, we pretended Nathan would be fine. Sigh. If you know someone going through the grieving process after a diagnosis, give them time to come to terms with it. It's a bitter pill to swallow for some. Maybe they will want to talk, and maybe they will live in denial for a while, like we did. Here's proof I was living in denial land. Tamara's Journal, May 22, 2003. It was a good day, but a long day. Nathan woke up early and I stayed up too late. I was reading more about autism and I just get frustrated because so many of the traits don't fit Nathan. I feel they didn't eliminate everything pre-diagnosis. What I didn't understand when Nathan was diagnosed was each child with autism is different. One might be low functioning, have speech delays and poor eye contact, but be okay with touch. Another child with autism might have so many sensory issues that they can't handle anyone touching them. Tags on their clothes irritate them and they don't communicate well. I must point out, it's not good to live in denial for too long. I've known people who completely want to ignore their child has a disability for years, even after a full diagnostic team has helped make a proper diagnosis. This is not the right way to live. It will not solve the problems at hand and only causes bigger problems later. Sometimes parents seek diagnosis after diagnosis until they get one they are happy with. I'm not sure it is fair to the child nor the parents in the long run. The addictions are coming whether you deny it or not, so it is better to eventually face the fact you have hit a detour. You cannot pretend you're living in Egypt when you're at the edge of the Red Sea. Our denial stage lasted for several months. But once Nathan's preschool teachers received the diagnosis, the amount of help he received surprised me. Since Nathan now had a label, I feared he would be treated differently in a negative way. What I didn't realize was that being treated differently meant he would get a lot more help. Once he had a diagnosis, people knew what techniques had been shown to help children with autism, and they used them, leaving me humbled and grateful. Anger and bargaining. Yes, I was mad at the diagnosing physician. How dare she condemn my child to a lifelong disability? (laughs) I know this is totally irrational of me, but that is how I felt. I was also angry at myself for having Nathan immunized. One of the theories at the time was immunization caused autism. I now understand that immunizations didn't cause his condition, but at this time, This thought led to a significant self-anger. It is important not to fall prey to these guilt trips. When you get a tough diagnosis, everyone has an opinion of what caused it. They mean well and often have valid ideas, but adding guilt to grief isn't the best way to approach diagnosis. We cannot change the past. So, Internalizing guilt over what you should have done or shouldn't have done doesn't change the outcome of the diagnosis. We can only change the future. So quit looking back. Look forward. I held anger for my husband, too. I think Justin cruised on through to the acceptance point of the grief cycle while I was still in the anger phase. I was angry at him because to me, this seemed like giving in or insufficient faith that God could heal Nathan. She was really mad at me for a time, and I didn't enjoy this one bit, but she didn't realize that I had already moved through the phases of grief towards acceptance. Part of this came from me seeing the signs long before we knew he had autism. 
From my journal entry on December 28, 2000, I mentioned how Nathan was really sick with the bad cold, so we prayed for him. I felt whispers from God teaching me that, and I quote, Nathan was such an obedient and developed man before he came to this earth that he had very little to accomplish on this earth and was to be a blessing to anyone who had his acquaintance, end quote. What an amazing thing to learn. Just a few months later, my mother called to explain some of the behavioral indicators Nathan was expressing, as Tamara mentioned. She could tell he was probably autistic. Mom encouraged us to get a qualified diagnosis to rule out autism. With the answers to my earlier prayers and then the conversation with my mom, I started to see Nathan's behaviors in a different light. When he continued to regress in his vocabulary, I could finally see he had autism. This triggered me into the grieving process. I knew that Nathan had special needs and that meant his development and social milestones would take him down an alternate path. This was very sad for me. Dads have so many dreams for their sons. I struggled and grieved privately because Tamara was recovering from the accident, managing a move, and now trying to get Nathan help without acknowledging a possible diagnosis. She would look at the mounting evidence, but continued to lean towards the alternate explanations, while I saw the majority of the evidence and accepted the weight of the facts. Tamara was defensive to the point of being in mama bear mode. I moved past denial pretty quickly and then through shock and anger and mild depression all on my own. I couldn't talk to Tamara about my feelings. I remember bargaining with God in my prayers, asking for miraculous healing or something like this. In just a few months, I had moved to acceptance about two years before Nathan received his full diagnosis. Fast forward to when we left Arkansas Children's Hospital after meeting with the diagnosis team. Tamara crashed very hard into denial, shock, and sadness. Her suffering seemed much deeper than mine. My role was to help her and support her. And this was easier for me because I had already experienced all that she was going through. I was able to be strong for her. Then I started to experience her anger and frustration with me in part because I wasn't in her grieving cycle with her. At the time she started lashing out at me, I was shocked and saddened, but tried not to take it personally. These feelings were generated from the loss of our dreams for Nathan. Tamara knew Nathan had autism now and was determined to find any fix or cure possible. Again, she was wide open to any possibilities, while I tended to gravitate to the more mainstream therapies and services. We would discuss any options and would test alternative solutions in tandem with educational programs. Tamara's strength is in considering all options. I didn't understand why Justin had already come to terms with the diagnosis. I felt like I needed to work as if everything depended on me and pray as if everything depended on God. And so I felt I had to try everything to fix my son gluten-free, casein-free diet, many different supplements and techniques. You name it, I tried it, or at least thought about trying it. Like a ship without an anchor in the middle of a storm, I tossed every which way searching for an answer because I didn't know which technique would heal him. I was begging God to send me back to Egypt. I was pleading because I didn't want this life. I was now facing at the edge of the Red Sea, nor did I want to go through the wilderness on the other side. My poor husband, we were both grieving in our own ways. I assumed he was processing all of this just like I was, when in reality, he had progressed beyond where I was because he sensed and acknowledged clues I didn't recognize for what they were. Different People process diagnosis differently, and that is okay. Some whip through it quickly and move on to acceptance. Others dally around in denial for way too long, like me, willing the diagnosis to be something else and fighting it once it's made. Therefore, patience and communication are crucial before, during, and after diagnosis. I was too stubborn to leave the anger stage behind so quickly. 
Anger fueled my will to find a way to heal my son. Most of all, though I hate to admit it, I blamed God and had an angry heart. I knew he could heal Nathan, and I couldn't understand why he wouldn't. I was mad because God was ruining my life and my plan. I know this sounds harsh, but I'm trying to tell this story as it really happened. I tried to bargain with him. I will live better, read my scriptures more, serve more, and pray more. I will do anything. Just heal Nathan. I was stubborn and proud. I didn't even want to think about the possibility that perhaps autism was in God's plan all along. I wasn't humble because I wanted my will, not his will. Surely wanting Nathan to be healed wasn't a bad thing. Why couldn't I convince God of this? Just because I was mad at God doesn't mean I stopped talking to him. I talked and prayed and vented every frustration, every difficult situation, every pain, heartache, sorrow. I emotionally vomited it all on God. Poor God. I'm sure he saw me as a tantruming child whose normal dream had been taken away. It was as if I was banging on the normal door of life, which had just been closed to me. I wanted to walk through that door. I wanted to have a normal family. I was going back to Egypt. I was going to climb the cliff or find some creative solution to get there. The problem is I was stuck because I couldn't climb my way out alone and God didn't want me to go back. He wanted me to go forward. He knew that the promised land he had in mind for me far exceeded the shallow pleasures of Egypt. What I couldn't understand or visualize was the promised land God was leading me towards. God's plan required I go a different route than I had ever imagined, and through a wilderness for many years, years that would refine me. And so, as I wept in a dead-end corner, God finally showed me that it wasn't a dead end after all. It was a detour. A detour is never a dead end with God on your side. Quote, And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will shew to you today. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. Then because Moses had cried unto him, God taught Moses what he needed to do to get out of the dead end. Quote, Lift thou up thy rod and stretch out thy hand over the sea and divide it, and the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Moses himself wondered what to do. After he asked, God told him how he was going to get out of the dead end. This is the key. When we pray, it is great when we talk, but it's more important that we listen. I think I was so busy grieving. I was doing most of the talking about my will. I had to learn to listen and hear God tell me how I was going to go forward. Quote, and Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong wind all that night and made the sea dry land and the waters divided. That is the answer. Go forward. Take this new and scary path you never knew was there, straight through the middle of the sea. It is a detour, not a dead end. Have faith. Take one step and then the next towards the promised land. Confession. I have never walked through a sea. It sounds kind of scary to me, 
But when the alternative is death by Egyptians, I'm sure the Israelites took one step at a time until they had crossed an insurmountable obstacle. This same lesson applied to me. I had to take baby steps of faith away from my normal expectations, away from Egypt. It was scary and hard, and I know I dragged my feet a little. No, I dragged my feet a lot. This is so true. We always comment that our life has been an experience in walking to the edge of darkness. We don't know where the path is going, and it is so frustrating. I really don't like it, and if I had my way, I'd have a huge spotlight shining miles ahead on my life path. But that isn't what God's plan looks like. Let me explain this concept in another way. Have you ever seen the movie Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade? It's a classic, and I feel no concern sharing a spoiler to anyone who hasn't seen it yet. You've had a few decades to watch it. So, In the movie, there's a scene where Indy needs to traverse an impossibly huge gap between two mountains. From the side Indy was on, the cave was adorned with an epic lion's head carving. The other side was just a cave-looking opening. The cliffs are sheer drop-offs, and no human could jump this space. I bet it's 30 feet wide. He must get to the other side. Lives depend on it. Then he remembers the cheat code his dad gave him before the journey. Only in the leap from the lion's head will he prove his worth. In this challenge, Indy would have to take the leap of faith across a huge canyon. In Hollywood dramatic fashion, he closes his eyes, puts out his foot, and takes a large step into the empty space and steps into a hidden path that is only painted to look like a deep chasm. Yeah! This is a classic scene. And the object of the challenge was for the person to believe they can cross the impossible gap, whether they can see the path or not. And so our life continues, and so I continue to struggle forward. Moving on. In a moment of undeserved mercy, God gave me a recurring dream, which I eventually asked him to stop. Not because it was scary, but because I was so sad when I woke up and found the dream wasn't real. In my dream, Nathan was talking and laughing and communicating normally with me. It was as if nothing was wrong with him. It was as if autism was the dream. My joy in the dream was immensely tangible. I talked to, really talked to, and played with my boy. I can still close my eyes and picture my son in that dream because I had it so frequently, it seemed to be burned into my permanent memory. I loved that dream. And then I'd wake up. And as the blissful dream slipped from my mind and reality hit, I cried. I grieved. I mourned again and again, and again, with each ensuing dream. Finally, I asked God to take the dream away, because the trauma of waking up and grieving each morning was too painful for my mama heart to handle. I haven't dreamed about my normal Nathan since. You might consider me weak. I'm sorry I was not strong enough to dream. The reality was too harsh each morning. I'm stronger now, but not strong enough to pray for the dreams to come back. With this dream, God helped me begin to turn my anger towards the next step of acceptance. Because the dream planted the seed of hope that someday, maybe not in this life, Nathan will be normal in an eternal promised land. In that day when the resurrection touches all of us, this innocent soul I have been blessed to raise will finally receive a perfected body, no longer afflicted by autism. In that day, I will finally get to see that dream 
become a reality. I can hardly wait for that dream to come true when I will ultimately communicate with my Nathan and we will laugh and talk like everyone else. We won't be hampered by autism anymore. And I won't have to wake up and see it all disappear. Depression and Acceptance Following the initial diagnosis, I woke up daily feeling as if there was a heavy weight called autism weighing on my chest. I pushed through the raging emotions because I had to. I was a young mother with children who needed me from sunup to sundown, and sometimes in the wee hours of the night. It was a full-time job. I was wandering through the wilderness. So every day, despite the weight on my chest, I would get up and feed and bathe and clothe and entertain my children I'd wipe faces, clean messes, drop my sweet Nathan off at his special preschool and hope some therapy, especially speech therapy, would help. I prayed morning, night, and in between to get me through the day. Through prayer, I soon realized something very important. I still had my little Nathan, and he hadn't changed with the diagnosis. He was still my little boy. Regardless of his diagnosis, I was still going to love him. He was my son. I learned something important that day. A diagnosis doesn't define a person. My son was first and foremost Nathan. The diagnosis didn't change who he was. I learned it was important to see people for who they are, not the labels affixed to them. The diagnosis was simply a way for professionals to name and properly treat an issue my son was experiencing. I had little time to dwell on this depression stage. It took me a long, tough year, instead of 40 years for the Israelites, to process everything and finally come to an acceptance that Nathan did indeed have autism. Although I had accepted this fact, the peace of acceptance had not yet settled upon my soul. The true acceptance took a bit longer, as I had a bit more sorrow to wade through. Throughout the diagnosis experience, I learned several important lessons. One, expectations are powerful dreams which are hard to replace when shattered. Two, God can turn dead ends into detours. Three, God's goal is to help us improve and get to the promised land, but we have to walk through the wilderness first. Four, going through the cycle of grief is normal and it takes time. Be gentle to yourself and patient with others walking the same path. Five, Go forward, trudge through each day, and repeat until you make it to the other side. As a teenager, I had a friend share a scripture with me that helped me understand this concept a little better. Romans chapter 8 verse 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. To me, this meant no matter what the situation or how it came about, God could help it all turn out for our good. God sees what I can become when I finally reach the promised land. And being God, he knows the best way to turn me into the person he knows I can become. But in order for that to happen, I must spend time in my own personal wilderness. The thing I learned passing through the wilderness was that you can rail against it or you can embrace it as a gift, a purifying experience that will refine your character, strengthen your faith, deepen your bonds with God, family, and friends, and in the end, give you hope. 
many of you out there feel like your life is chaotic, crazy, and completely awful compared to the norm? What if I were to tell you that you are normal for you? I am so excited to announce that my book, Normal For Me by Tamara K. Anderson is now available for purchase on Amazon. This book took me 10 years to write and I share 20 years worth of lessons learned in my life detours, including being in a car accident and having two of my children diagnosed on the autism spectrum. In this book, I share the secrets of how I made it from despair to peace with God's help. I also include a bonus diagnosis survival guide at the very end of my Normal For Me book. The diagnosis survival guide includes 12 tips to survive and thrive in tough times. Wouldn't you like to know what those are? So what are you waiting for? Grab your copy of Normal For Me today on Amazon. Chapter 7. My Toolbox I received my first toolbox for Christmas when I was 12 years old. I know, some of you are thinking, what were your parents thinking giving a 12-year-old girl a toolbox? I am not a stereotypical girl because I loved that toolbox. I loved fixing things around our house. If a drawer broke, my mom would call me. Dad was often at work. And I would take it apart, figure out how it worked, what was wrong, and how I could fix it. This is how my brain works. I love solving problems. Over the years, I bought a new tool here and there to help me fix something in the house. By the time Justin and I married, I brought a full toolbox to our first apartment. I felt like I've hit the jackpot here. Tamara still fixes a lot of things around the house, and I love it. Toolbox of Learning when Nathan was initially diagnosed with autism, the things I knew about autism would have fit on an index card. I felt overwhelmed thinking about this new diagnosis because I feared the unknown. Usually people fear what they don't know or understand. My autism toolbox was empty. I began reading books about autism. I learned kids on the autism spectrum like sticking to schedules. Dang, this was a hard tool to learn because I'm a bit spontaneous. I joined an autism support group who held meetings and attended conferences that gave me hammers, saws, and screwdrivers to put in my autism toolbox. An example of one of these tools is that people on the autism spectrum are usually visual learners, so it is more effective to teach them using books, videos, or computers. The more I learned, the more empowered I felt to fix or problem solve the challenges I faced every day raising my kids with autism. I had a toolbox now. Using my toolbox. Once a week, our family has a family night. We sing together, pray together, and have a short gospel lesson, play games, and have a treat. One of the hardest things for me when my family was young was helping my children with autism participate in our special family time so that each member of our family could truly participate. One day, a few years ago, as I prepared a short lesson for our family night, I puzzled how to help my sons with autism participate. So I used one tool that has always worked for me, prayer. I told God I wanted to involve my entire family, but I didn't know how to do it. I figured my children were God's children before they were ever mine, and I asked him to teach me what to do. No sooner had I presented my request when thoughts and ideas came to my mind. One of the first ideas I had was to make a poster of the songs we sang so the kids could follow along. I sat down and wrote the song out. I drew little pictures as well, where appropriate, so the kids, even those who couldn't read yet, could learn the songs. Now, Nathan won't usually sing while we sing, but I discovered he would shine a flashlight on each word while we sing. That was his way of participating. God inspired me to use the visual learning tool from my autism toolbox to help Nathan participate. Another dilemma presented itself when Nathan was in middle school. He has always struggled with verbally expressing himself, and we decided to work with his teachers to improve his verbalization. 
When you look into Nathan's eyes, you can see his brain working. You can see there's so much going on and so much he could say. But for some reason, with his autism, there's a disconnect between thinking something and being able to say it. Can you imagine how frustrating that would be? In my research into helping nonverbal children with autism communicate better, I stumbled upon the tool that some of these children did well when exposed to sign language. I tried it, even though I knew it was a long shot. At the annual goal planning meeting with Nathan's teacher that year, we coordinated a plan to teach him a little bit of sign language through simple movies because he learned best through visual examples. We focused on simple phrases like, I am hungry, I am thirsty, I need to go potty, or I want iPad. My husband is very good at making simple movies on the computer. With our family making the movies, we could customize them to exactly what Nathan needed to learn. We then burned the sign language movies to a DVD. These short movies taught Nathan basic words in sign language. Subsequently, we sent a copy to school so they could reinforce what we did at home. A miracle happened. Once Nathan learned a word by signing it, he could say it verbally, even when he didn't sign it. We had found the key to unlock his communication block. His spoken vocabulary increased dramatically. We celebrated. He could now say, I want a cookie, or sign and say, thirsty. This was a huge success for my sweet 10-year-old boy. I consider it a miracle God led me to find the right tool to effectively teach sign language to Nathan. God also paved the way for an entire team of people to help us. I'm thankful for everyone who helped. He led me to make a new friend who just happened to know sign language. We couldn't have done the movies without her. Then Nathan's teachers at school worked as a team, helping him to progress past the barriers which had kept him silent for too long. I really enjoy making small movies for the family. When Tamara came to me with the idea to teach Nathan words using sign language, I was thrilled to get to work. Tamara filmed a friend signing the words and phrases we wanted to teach Nathan. Then I created little segments that went something like this. Expert signs and says the word bus. Various family members then sign and say bus. Expert signs and says the phrase Time to go. Family members do this. Expert signs and says the phrase, time to go to bus. Family members do the same. Then the screen says, now it's Nathan's turn. Then the words and phrases show up at intervals so that Nathan can practice. Then we all celebrate with the great big, great job, Nathan. It didn't take long for me to see that this was a brilliant idea. We would send a DVD of these to school. Teachers would show them to the entire special needs class. Pretty soon, Nathan and most of his peers would be either saying or signing these phrases. This was really funny at times because the videos were so specific to Nathan. So when all of Nathan's class could say his address or phone number, we knew that these videos were effective. Some videos worked better than others, but we saw an improvement in the words that Nathan would say to us. And I got a bit crazy with this. I started theming the videos around activities or movies or whatever Nathan loved. My favorite was the Star Wars one, where we did a lot of video in front of a green screen. Nathan still likes watching that one, primarily because I put some funny outtakes at the end of it. He still repeats the lines we messed up. The time and effort to create these videos was so insignificant compared to the joy and satisfaction I felt when Nathan opened up a little more to us. Another miracle occurred when we were trying to get Nathan to stay in his room until it was time to wake up. Our school district offered a class on teaching children on the autism spectrum through making social stories, and I happily attended. I knew it would add another tool to my autism toolbox. A social story is a book you make which helps your child know what a certain situation should look like socially. The school district then gave us the opportunity to come down to the district offices for a day and use school equipment to make our social story with the specialist to help us along the way. They even had special education teachers there to help us with specific questions we might have. This was a fantastic addition to my autism toolbox. 
I wrote a social story with pictures which talked about how Nathan needed to stay in his room until 6 a.m., no matter what time he woke up. We then read this little book nightly before bed. Reading the book, coupled with persistence, melatonin, and noisemakers, helped Nathan sleep better. And because he was sleeping better, we slept better. The miracle was, once we got Nathan sleeping better, his behavior improved dramatically. His tantrums decreased, and he seemed happier. I cannot tell you how crucial this was for our overall health and his. What a great tool to learn and apply with success. This same scenario can be applied to any issue, cancer, diabetes, depression, anxiety, high blood pressure, etc. Learn all you can and put tips in your toolbox of learning. Perhaps deep breathing will help when anxiety skyrockets, or painting your nails will help you keep them from falling off during chemotherapy. There are lots of tips and tricks you can learn to help with different challenges. I had to learn different tools to my mothering toolbox as I learned to juggle the demands of four children, two of whom had autism. I learned to encourage differently when Jacob always wanted to win. I found out saying, anyone who makes it to the top of the stairs is a winner, worked better than first one to the top wins. This inevitably caused a meltdown because Jordan would win and Jacob would cry. God is a perfect teacher if we are willing to go to him with dilemmas. Sometimes he sends friends to help us with the solutions. I've had many light bulb moments while talking to friends about perplexing situations in my life. Other times we've had to visit the doctor when we hit a dead end. I've also found answers on the internet. Google is great. Learning also occurred at different conferences on autism. Books are also some of my best friends. There is a world of knowledge out there to be gained, and I believe God expects us to do our part to learn, so he isn't working with a blank slate. We need to put tools of learning in our toolbox of life and then turn to God to guide us on which tool we need to use at the right time to fix whatever problem we are facing. Now, there are some solutions you cannot find in a book or on the internet or from a friend. I have found myself in that predicament many times and have learned God will often answer my prayers with the inspiration I need, sometimes immediately and sometimes not so immediately. But somehow, some way, God will help us proceed and know how to keep going. He will help us solve the problems within our control and give us patience and wisdom to endure those which aren't. So, no matter what diagnosis you are facing, fill your toolbox full of knowledge. Learn, read, take classes, discuss with specialists, and talk with others in your situation. Knowledge helps us overcome fear. When you pair your toolbox of knowledge with God, you will find solutions to the perplexing situations around you. You will learn to fix things like I learned to solve problems with my toolbox at 12. It is empowering. Give it a try. Hey, thanks so much for listening to today's show. I know that there are many of you out there that are going through a hard time, and I hope you found things that have been useful today as you listen to the podcast. If you would like to access the show notes from today's podcast, visit my website. It is storiesofhopepodcast.com. That is where you'll find favorite quotes from today's episode and shareable memes. And those are fun because you can share them with your friends on social media. You will also find the links mentioned throughout today's episode so you don't have to remember what those were. And also all the tips that were shared. Sometimes tips are shared so much throughout an episode you forget. What were those great things? So go to the show notes, storiesofhopepodcast.com to look up these fantastic resources. You know, if someone kept coming to mind during today's episode, perhaps that means that you should share this with them. Maybe there was a story shared or a tip that they really, really need to hear. So go ahead and share this episode with them. May God bless you, especially if you are struggling with hope to carry on and with the strength to keep going when things get tough. Remember, to walk with Christ 
and he will help bear that burden. Above all else, remember, God loves you.